Jeremiah writing, the Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, we've, we've just got, there's so many layers to that fairly simple statement. We have the foreknowledge of God. That's a bit of an amazing thing that God, because we sometimes, for some, they struggle, you know, there's like over 8 billion people in the world right now and they struggle to think that, you know, God might pay attention to them when there's, you know, 8 billion people in the world. But we've got supercomputers now that can make that many decisions in a second and God is much, 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 infinitely much more than a human created supercomputer. He has no problem knowing you, your thoughts, your words, your daily activities, your spontaneity. He's there for you. But what this verse says, it's not just that God's got his eyes on you and paying attention to you now. God says, I knew you before I formed you. So we've got this, now you, you, you step back into these eternal realms, and this is called the foreknowledge of God. That he's the Alpha and the Omega, he's the beginning and the end, that is before time was even created, and when there was nothing inside the very heart of God was your name. So here we go, here's where we're going uh, tonight. I said missions and the call of God. Um, really, we're going to be looking at this kind of intersect between the call of God and the will of humanity. There's lots of examples in the Bible where you have the call of God, which bumps into a rebellious attitude in humanity. It happens in you. It happens in me. We've got multiple examples. I thought this is a good one just because it's really well known. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. And believe me, Nineveh, as a conquering uh, world power at the time, were in incredibly evil. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction uh, to get away from the Lord, etc., etc., etc. With Jonah, we've, we've got other examples. How about the example of someone like King Saul? When King Saul was told to do something in battle and he did the opposite... And, and the same man, Samuel, has to say to him, how foolish. You have not kept the command of the Lord that uh, the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, look at this interplay now. Just think about the call of God. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. So now you've got the call of God and you've got the activity of an individual and they crash into each other, and there's consequence. Now, there's lots of examples of this in the Bible. I love the candor of the Bible, and it should give us all hope. Because while Jonah ran in the opposite direction, you get this engagement with God over it, and he ends up stepping back into the purposes of God. You have the Apostle Peter sitting on the roof there in Joppa, and he's having this vision, and God has to give it to him three times over, and, and the Lord is speaking to him in the vision, and his response is, no, Lord. You know, like, get up and eat. He goes, he goes no, Lord. And, they, and God says, don't call unclean that which I've called clean. And he has it again, and he goes, no. And God says, no, don't, don't do it like that. Third time. And Peter goes, no. So you are not alone in saying no to the call of God. I just wanted to catch that. Because to talk about the call of God, especially when you're talking about mission and the will of God and the call of God and then the will of humanity, and for many people, there is that sneaking suspicion that maybe I've already burned my chance. And there's this thing called the grace of God. It's a favor that you don't deserve. I'm going to come to that in just a sec. It's, it's a beautiful thing, the grace of God. There's also forgiveness there's restoration. There's lots of beautiful things. But this call does require obedience and faithfulness. You will step into the purposes of God with an obedient and humble heart. We need to faithfully and obediently step in to those things which God has done to us. I'm a huge believer in the call of God. And I've told you this so many times, but I just need to keep coming back to it because we've all only got our own story. 
But I remember as a young, like a 15-year-old atheist, saying to a friend, I feel like my life has been set apart to make a difference in Australia. That's a sense of destiny. I didn't even know God. But he was already, the seed was there. I can remember 14 years before Crossway called me. It was Pastor Stuart who called me initially. Can I chat to you about the senior pastor role of Crossway? 14 years earlier, God had already put a call in my heart specifically about Crossway. These, see, this call of God thing, and it is my genuine conviction that the call of God rests in each of our lives in a way that's unique to us as individuals. And it's really important for us to get that. But there are quite specific calls as well. It's really important for us to be willing to embrace the very nature of a specific call. Most of you are probably not called to the nations. Your specific call will be reasonably local, most of you. Some of you are going to breathe a sigh of relief right now. And honestly, some of you, you're called to be teachers. Some of you, you're, you're called to be surgeons or doctors, you're, uh, uh, co- company leaders, sparkies, trays, you know, whatever, whatever your domain. For many, and in, in that sense, and you would have, would have heard this statement before, God is far more concerned with who he's making you than where he's placing you. Your who is far more significant than your where. But let's not underestimate the significance of a particular calling which can affect where and what. As in what what God's calling you to do. So you don't earn a call. We'd like to think you can earn a call, but you don't earn a call. It's actually to do the sovereign grace of God. We position ourselves well. It doesn't matter who we are. We position our lives well with a humble and submitted heart. What's God saying? What am I going to do about it? And we, we live in this great relationship with him and we live into the purposes of God for sure. But that does not determine the call. The call is determined by God himself. It's this gift of God and the call of God is not dissimilar in that sense. It's an act of grace. But obedience to the call is an act of will. This is this interesting interplay between the call of God and the willfulness of humanity. Because I dare say, some of you are quite intentionally right now, and if intentionally is too strong a word, let me put it a different way. You have a haunting suspicion that there is a call that you're currently not living in. Can you relate to that? Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. Don't be surprised when the call of God is stirred in your heart that your human nature defaults to, I'm disqualified because... It's like, God's got to be able to find someone better than me. Like, there's got to be a more perfect human being than me. There's got to be someone who doesn't live with the sort of struggles that I live with. Don't don't disqualify yourself because you've got a pulse. It's what you do with the temptation, whether you've sinned or not. Yes? And then there's always the opportunity to get up again and experience forgiveness. So there's the very predictable uh, personal disqualification followed by God's qualification. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young. You must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you to say. And then we've got the absolutely predictable fear that God speaks to it. And don't be afraid of the people. I love one of the translations. Which one? It might be the King James, I'm not sure, where it says, and because it's very literal, don't be afraid of their faces. I like that actually. Like you're nice and all, but some of you are pretty scary, to be honest with you. <laughs> Don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. And then we'll get this provision of God. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, 
I have put my words in your mouth. Guess what? You know what I'm doing right now? I am the delivery boy and nothing more. I didn't bake the bread. I'm just, I'm just the delivery guy. I'm the Uber guy of the Word of God. I didn't cook it. I didn't write it. I'm just the delivery boy of God's Word. So it's the ultimate appointment. He says to Jeremiah, Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. And when, <clears throat> when you stand in the call of God, there's a grace and a provision that rests upon you that is not experienced when you stand outside of the purposes of God. In the purposes of God, there's a release of spiritual power. In the purposes of God, there's a release of authority. In the purposes of God, there is a release of resources that are not experienced outside of the purposes of God. A compelling spirit, as in something stirs inside your heart of the Holy Spirit, and you feel compelled. That is core. You then, of course, have the commanding scriptures, because God is never going to contradict himself. If you've got a compelling spirit to go and have an adulterous affair, it's not the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, you've got this compulsion in, in your spirit to go and steal or to lie or to cheat or do something that's unjust. It's not the Holy Spirit. There's a commanding scriptures. God doesn't contradict himself. Compelling spirit, commanding scriptures. The counsel of the saints. And I would say that in the context of seeking wise counsel from like-minded, mature Christians. I'm not alluding here to praying to deceased Christians. I'm talking about engaging with other more mature Christians and just bouncing the thought around with them, discerning in that collective sense. You've got common sense as well uh, with regard to who you are and what the call is, and that will also engage with the Council of the Saints. And of course, then you've got your circumstantial setting. What kind of object is five CSs there? Okay. So there is a process. It's not just, oh, something's triggered inside of me. That's it. It's said, it's done, it's written, it's tattooed, it's in, it's in eternity. No, there is a discerning process uh, with regards uh, to the call of God. So there we are. There's our core text for today. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you to be my... You now fill in the blank. 